All right. Well, welcome to our February RPS District Family Engagement Meeting. I'm really glad that you're here on Valentine's Day of all days for us to have a meeting. Um, as I mentioned, this meeting will be recorded and then posted on the RPS Family Engagement webpage after our meeting. Uh, so it will be accessible. So your participation is also your consent to uh, be recorded, although I have it set. So it's mostly going to be recording me and our highlighted speakers uh, throughout the meeting. So let's go ahead and begin. So as I said, welcome to all of you. So glad that you're here. We have uh, multiple different uh, individuals here. We have some parents, we have some school district staff, some community members, and typically also some school board members joining us. So uh, welcome to all of you. My name is Jennifer Spindler Craig, and I'm the coordinator of family engagement here in Rochester Public Schools in the Department of Equity and Engagement. And I've been in this position for a few months prior to the prior to this position. I was a teacher, instructional coach in RPS for the last uh, 18 years. Uh, I'd love to hear who we have with us. So could you please type your name in the chat, your connections to RPS, if you are a parent, maybe uh, an employee, a community member, let us know your connection to RPS. And one fun thing about your day, maybe you have something fun for Valentine's Day, uh, some event coming up or a cute moment, uh, go ahead and put in the chat, who are you? What are your connections to RPS? And something fun about your day. So I mentioned, my name is Jennifer Spindler Craig, coordinator of family engagement. And one fun thing about my day is that it started off, my dad texted me a poem that I know he wrote himself. Uh, Sunsets are red, water is blue, fishing is sweet, and so are you. That was my Valentine poem from my dad. So that was a good start to my day. I see lots of great things in the chat. Um, uh, thank you for introducing yourselves. We have uh, school counselors and uh, Deborah Seelinger back from New Mexico with uh, fresh uh, cookies. We have, um, oh great, we've got uh, Leah joining us as well. Welcome to Peter. Oh, and Sarah, your daughter's birthday on Valentine's Day. That's wonderful. Do we have anyone new to us today? Anyone joining us for the first time? All right. Is there anyone who'd like to turn on your microphone and tell us about a fun thing uh, that you either typed or didn't get to type yet? So anybody at a school site where there's a lot of enthusiasm and Valentine's and candy and all of it going on? Yes, lots of it. <laughs> and lots of it. And red and pink and excitement. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of the, the fun energy of the day. For, for some of you, you might, uh, you might be too inundated with it, uh, but hopefully there's a lot of, a lot of fun with the, uh, the chocolate, the colors, the uh, little boxes. Is that still, still kind of a thing, like boxes and bags with the little Valentines? I have worked, I was working on it all last night. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of those moms who will say that, oh, I think it's okay. Walmart will still have candy. But then <laughs> I went yesterday and it was like a war zone. I'm like, what is going on here? It's just a candy, but it's okay. It went well. But this morning was my other struggle with my kindergartner because he was like, I have to wear red today. So where are my red t-shirts? <laughs> 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 have to dig through the yeah. like at my house dig through the the laundry basket and, and then what type of red and he's like this is too dark this is too light and i'm like oh it's a kindergarten come on and he's like well i have to look good because the teacher is going to take a picture uh, they take it like serious <laughs> yeah. for sure i can just picture you in the candy aisle too <laughs> 
<laughs> whatever you can for that Valentine's Day. Oh, that is funny. Thanks, Khadija, for telling us about that. It is, and it's fun, funny that, well, funny, but not funny, of course. There's a lot of work involved for parents, right? Getting all of it ready <laughs> on that front end, making sure all those Valentines are ready, uh, ready to roll for multiple kids. All right. And anyone else? Well, thank you. Hopefully there's going to be some fun and you can read about uh, all of all of the great things that were highlighted in the chat. So wish us all luck as we go forward with our Valentine's Day. Uh, a, a, a reminder, acknowledgement that RPS sites are situated on ancestral lands of the Dakota people. And we acknowledge and honor the Dakota nations and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. This is from our RPS equity statement. And also uh, our, my colleague, Amelia Cordell has a lovely newsletter every month. Uh, and this is from her newsletter. And I'm not sure actually if Amelia is with us at the moment. Amelia, are you out there yet? Maybe not quite yet. That's okay, she said I can go ahead with this. Uh, but from her, um, her wonderful newsletter that she puts together every month about uh, indigenous populations in Rochester Public Schools. She included this slide uh, indicating how unique Rochester Public Schools is and the diversity of different uh, indigenous nations that are represented in our public schools. So you can see the names of the uh, many of the nations that our students are part of. And she says, if any nation has been missed, if you or if you know someone who is part of another uh, Native nation, uh, you can email her and she'll add to her growing list uh, the names of these nations represented in RPS. So that is uh, from uh, Amelia from her newsletter. And of course, February is Black History Month. And so we want to uh, recognize the historical contributions of our Black African American uh, community members and also think about the present uh, contributions and progress that we hope to make as a community toward more equitable and just uh, circumstances uh, as we move forward. So thinking about that, of course, in February and all months as we go forward. So with that, let's talk about our agenda. We have so much that we want to do today. This is often uh, an issue for me that that I have lots of lots of things that are in mind, and we have lots of partners who are enthusiastic about sharing uh, sharing ideas. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, success sharing, what's going on in the Rochester Public Schools. We're going to have a spotlight on. Mayo High School, but beyond Mayo High School into the community uh, with Brenda Shamblin, who's going to be talking a little bit about some of the community outreach going on with the Mayo High School community. We're also going to have a brief overview and discussion about the family engagement uh, dual capacity building framework and the Minnesota model. And we'll hear from Dustin Morrow about Rochester Public Schools safe routes to schools and the bike fleet. We're also going to be hearing from Amy Baker about some amazing outreach, uh, outreach that's going on with early childhood and family education. So if you have not heard Amy talk about some of this amazing outreach with partners like Jeremiah Program and Family Promise and Reach and more, um, please uh, stay with us to hear those updates from, uh, from Amy. And we'll finish things off with some updates and good news to share as we round out our time together. So that's our agenda, which brings us to this question of, uh, what are some bright moments in RPS family engagement from the past month? So I'd love to hear from some of you about things that have been going on either at your site, or if you have kids, what's been going on at their schools, might be events, or maybe it's just some interactions that you've had uh, recently, what are some of those bright moments? I can start off with one example, and maybe some of you would like to turn on a microphone and tell us about some others. One bright moment uh, was that last night, I 
participated with um, with two of our bilingual interpreters, um, Suher Abushara and Nawal uh, Saad, along with Natalia Benjamin, our coordinator of uh, multilingual learning. And we had a, a parent meeting in Arabic and English last night, and we had several uh, families attend. It was online, and we met for about an hour and a half, and listened and discussed and had some really amazing uh, conversation in Arabic and English, uh, really great collaborative. And it was it was impactful in lots of ways. So that was a bright moment uh, for me in family engagement this last month. Is there anybody else who'd be willing to tell us about something that has been a highlight for you? You can also use the chat if you prefer that. Well, I'll go ahead. I'm Don Barlow. I'm a member of the school board. Uh, I had an opportunity this past Saturday to attend a Somali cultural event um, at their STEM school location. And the uh, purpose of it was to invite community in to allow uh, those who may not have any aspect of familiarity to uh, develop uh, a introduction uh, to culture. A number of uh, members of the Somali uh, community presented uh, in addition to a number of uh, state level of elected officials were also present. Uh, I think with the same desire as mine to, to learn more and to then become more uh, supportive of and connected to. So I'm glad I was able to uh, be a part of that. What a great event to bring together community, family members, and to hopefully have some collaboration and, and learning together. Thank you. All right. Well, I know there have been some other some other great events. Elton Hills had something fun last yeah, week. Yeah, I was just gonna share we had our <clears throat> second bingo night great turnout again <clears throat> excuse me i'm sorry um over 350 people attended um we were packed to the brim again but it's always so enjoyable lots of new faces coming this time and also old ones but it's fun to see our students come back from other schools um and visit so we saw some families who were here before come back um, our next upcoming event is going to be books, bikes, and braids. So we're working on coordinating that all together, and we're excited. And then we're going to do a big Elton Hills block party to round out the school year and have um, local food trucks here. We're going to – everybody will get ice cream. We'll have ice cream for everybody and just games and lots of things. So we're excited for our upcoming events. That's great. I'm glad you let us into that next question, too, because maybe there are some people who have some things coming up. In fact, I shouldn't say maybe because I've been working with a lot of our Title I schools recently, and there are a lot of plans for spring <laughs> for when the weather is a little bit nicer, some outdoor family uh, community events that are going to be taking place. So a lot of, uh, a lot of things that are up and coming for sure. And I know, yeah, go ahead. Khadija. I always, I also wanted to share a little bit. Um, I don't know if there's anybody from Franklin here, Franklin Elementary. We had our um, marvelous moms that we usually have once a month, but this one was a little different. We used to have issues with people not coming, parents not coming, but with our organization, we're reaching more moms um, to come to events and they actually came. It was super early. It was, we had to be there by eight. But it was good. And we had um, some, um, there was a book reading for Black History Month. And then we had um, snacks and just like, well, early breakfast and just um, color, fun, coloring. It was really nice. I liked it. And a lot of people showed up. 
Well, that sounds like a wonderful way to start the day. Really fun for moms and and mother figures. I I love how it's inclusive of yep. of any you know like moms or grandmas or aunties or family mm-hmm. member. Um, and when you were talking about that, Khadija, is part of the increase in participation because of the work that you've been doing with Pomoja Women to yeah. advertise that. Yep, yep, yep. So we had two days before the event where we had to like, um, because we use WhatsApp and just have all the um, families on there, all the women on there, just kind of sending out the flyer for Marvelous Mom and just saying that, you know, most of the time they ask, will you be there? Because of language barrier being the biggest one. And like, yeah, I'll be there. I will be there bright and early. So I was there with Janine um, and just setting everything up. And I was very surprised that a lot of people showed up. Great work. I love that collaboration. And most of you know Khadija uh, from other places, but Khadija is one of the uh, co-founders of Pomoja Women and, of course, really engaged in, in community uh, community work in every in every capacity <laughs> form. So that's, that's, that's a great um, thing that you mentioned, too, about WhatsApp as being such a powerful mode of communication. I know in the school district, we're using talking points, which has a bit of a texting feature and translates into multiple languages. And WhatsApp is still utilized by a lot of our multilingual families. And so that's a, another good tool for communication. Have you found that too, Khadija? WhatsApp has been a good one. Yeah, it's it's one way where they um, get connected to family back home. So it's easy for them. It Even like being in the same town, sometimes I get a call from someone on WhatsApp. I'm like, use your regular line and don't use this line. I know when you're calling um, on like, you know, back home, you can use WhatsApp, but I'm like, you could just text me, but they're still insisting on using that to call and just to kind of communicate. But that's one big app that works for us. Well, thank you for all that you're doing to promote events and to and to build these relationships between uh, between various communities and schools and to really work for the benefit of our of our kiddos. Nice work. All right, lots of good things. I know there were many other things going on, lots of sledding events and mobile haircuts at Franklin and at Gage recently, and lots of schools having events. So thank you um, to all those things, all all of uh, you who have been uh, creating events, organizing them, promoting them, and to lots of families who've been participating in them. So let's transition to look at um, kind of a spotlight on what's going on with Mayo High School and beyond uh, family engagement. And to do that, we have the amazing Brenda Shamblin here, who is the Student Resiliency Specialist at Mayo High School. And Brenda kindly agreed to talk about some of the initiatives going on in the uh, in that community. And we have lots of great photos that you'll love in these slides. So Brenda, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me. This is, uh, I'm super excited to share about all that. And before we get into the slides, I just want to apologize in advance. I will have to leave the meeting uh, when I'm done speaking because I don't know if you saw on the news last night, but it's mental health week here at Mayo High School, and I will have therapy dogs in er, a therapy dog in my room for each of the uh, lunch hours. So. Um, we have four dogs coming in today. We just had a great um, presentation by Josh Jensen with uh, the Green Bandana Project. Um, and a mom uh, shared about losing her son to suicide. So we have a ton of incredible things going on this week. But it also means my window is short this morning. And so uh, I appreciate you having me. So, um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about our past um, community events and Um, These are actually things that we do um, spring and fall every year. So these are just examples of what we've done this past year. Um, I'd be remiss if I um, didn't first start with the the great team um, that I'm surrounded by to be able to 
uh, put on all of these wonderful events. And in the top picture, I, I heard her mentioned earlier today, the, the wonderful Janine Staven. We work very closely together as feeder, um, as you know, Franklin is one of our feeder schools. So we've done all of these events together. So, um, and then also Beth Martinez, um, what as the equity specialist, she's since moved into another position, but Beth was also a part of that team. And then on the, in this picture on the left is the um, three of the admin from uh, Mayo High School, Ryan Bacon in the back, Carrie Eckert dressed as Sparty, and then Todd Pearson, they're all um, assistant principals here at Mayo High School. They attend every single one of uh, the community events that we put on. So I really appreciate their support and um, also being there. And then in the front is Bonnie Mockley. Um, she's one of our social workers. Um, also, I, I, I'm just surrounded by a great team. Amanda Burgett and Juan Vasquez also um, are, are attending our events as um, support. So anyway, so that's the team. A great team. Lots yes, of good support. Awesome. Awesome team. So last spring, we um, we did four community events. Um, one was at Oak Terrace Estates Parkside um, in the boulevard there. As you can see, Sparty, of course, uh, attends all of these events and is a, a big hit. Um, we were able to get inflatables for three of our four events last spring, which also were uh, um wildly popular and um, super fun. And then I just grabbed some snapshots of our high schoolers. I came from Ben Franklin and so elementary as the community and family liaison there. And I was used to hundreds showing up for these events. So it's been a bit um, of a transition for me because in high school, there are just few, you know, fewer high school students that attend. Um, but that being said, that's why we partner with our feeder schools. And we know ultimately there's a good chance they'll end up at Mayo High School. And we're just the, the whole point of all of it is to meeting our families where they're at and building those relationships with them. Um, you can't see it here. You can see it more in others. So we can keep going, Jennifer. So at all of our events, we also invite community partners. So it's a little bit hard to see. So this event was Homestead um, at the Homestead Village Edgewood Apartments. We were like right in between. Um, so at all of our events, we provide food of some kind. Um, we were blessed with a grant last year. We were able to, besides pizzas, we were able to have sambosas and uh, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, and um, tacos. So we were able to support some other local businesses with some fun um, other foods. But then we also bring, you, I think you can see in the picture, we also bring um, uh, other food support. So shelf-stable food for our families to take um, when, when they leave. So, um, and then um, it, so you can see in the background, so some of the community partners, Spectrum attended several of our events last year. Um, the health department frequently attends. RCTC is awesome, and they come with a great a bus and uh, have a play games and prizes. And then... Um, it, and so some of the others, it varies. Community Ed has come to our events. We just, we invite everyone. And if, if you can make it, you know, great. And if it doesn't work, that's okay too. Yeah, there, I've, I've noticed that lots of community partnership at your events. Yes. And so this one is at um, Friendship Place. Um, you can get a little better visual of Jamie there in front of the RCTC bus. Um, and then, of course, they have that built-in basketball court, which was wonderful. So we were, we did not have inflatables there as there really wasn't a great place to um, set up. But you can see tons of people. Once again, we we're offering food, not only food to eat that night, a, a family meal, but also um, uh non-perishable food items that they can take with them. We Frequently, the Rochester Police Department and Fire Department also attend these events. I guess I don't have the fire truck in there, but I know they were at that event. I needed more space, Jennifer, but you know. <laughs> at, at your fall event uh, at Friendship Place, I did see the fire truck and the firefighters loved that, um, interacting with the kids. Um, and the kids were, of course, climbing all over and enjoying that a lot. 
And this one, last year, we decided to add Ben Franklin, which would make sense as a site for one of our um, community events. So, um, and we did have a a nice amount of our high school students attend as well. And many of them brought either younger siblings or nieces and nephews. And so that was really fun too. And at the Franklin event, the bookmobile also joined us. So they were doing tours. They were able to do library cards uh, and all those kinds of things and just to see it. And uh, speaking of the bookmobile and library, um, they are very happy to come out with bookmobile or to certain events and bring books. In fact, um, uh, Heather Acero at the uh, RP, uh, RPL at the public library has said that they currently have um, free books that they can give out. Um, they have more at the elementary school uh, grade level uh, uh, books uh, available, but for those of you who are planning spring events, you can keep Rochester Public Library in mind as a partner. Awesome. Okay, so this was an idea from um, one of the moms here from um, at uh, Mail High School. She suggested we just do a pop-up event with information. So as you can see, we had great representation from all of our schools. I want to give Brian Bothan a shout out to his team and how many were able to come. Literally, we planned this in less than a week. It was a very short notice. We did do it during the day, which is probably helpful with schedules. All of our other um, community events tend to be in the evening, either 5, 5 to 6.30, you know, that kind of thing. So we just decided, um, let's just show up. We let, this is at the gates, right? Am I at the gates here? That the apartment complex? Yes, the gates. I'm sorry. Um, so we, we let them know we were coming. We had a table outside. We were close enough to the building. So we had Wi-Fi. So we had someone there helping with, with um, Skyward if Parents needed help with that. And then each of the buildings brought other information that they may have, newsletters. Um, we brought free and reduced forms. We had informa more, the information about Channel One, all that kind of stuff. And then, as you can see, many of our bilinguals, equity specialists. It was just a fabulous. And this was either, this was right around the beginning of November. Look at that day, 70, around 70 degrees. And I, I'm not kidding, when the bookends <laughs> of that day were in the 40s. Our day came, it was 70 degrees. It was incredible. So we weren't always busy. Not a ton of people stopped by. So then we just walked through the parking lot, introducing ourselves. Uh, you know, we just, we, you know, again, we're just there as the a face of Rochester Public Schools and to, to help. So it was, it, it was super fun. And I think it was, we only were there for like an hour and a half. So it was short and very manageable, but we had, we had a lot of fun. And what I love about that is that you were, were responding to the request of a parent yes. uh, and making that idea come to fruition. Uh, so that's, that is a, a beautiful thing about this event. Yeah, it, it was super, it was, it was awesome. It was really fun. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so um, o the Oak Terrace and Parkside again. So we we didn't have formal outdoor um, fall events. And so we decided we're a little late in the season. So we decided to try something different. And we went inside in November for what we called the thankful event. Um, and we served pumpkin pie. We brought um, supplies to make um, those little... Uh, wheelie things what are those you know what those things you know what i mean by Not that those little pinwheels pinwheels yes and then um we had many pumpkins that um i went to um sea caps and they gave us a really it was at the end of, so they gave us a really great price on um on those so then the kiddos could either paint or color um pumpkins that day happened to be raining, interesting, I know, in November, like a sleet rain kind of a thing. So because we were inside and there's a little bit of barrier because their community room is up and behind the hill. So we didn't have a whole lot of people attend. Um, but we, you know, again, our theory is we're, we're just going to be present. And when it works for families, it works. And we understand when it, it doesn't. So. Oh, that's wonderful. And. Uh, that Oak Terrace and Parkside area is 
uh, near near Longfellow School, actually, right across Marion Road. Yes. And that's a community that you've been very involved with over these last couple of years and on a consistent basis have events. Here's another one. Yes. So, yes. So then, um, so at, in our conversation with Jell, who is the manager at Oak Terrace um, in Parkside, um, we talked about just being a part of her scheduled events rather than us creating and deciding what if we support her with food and other things for things because she doesn't really have a budget for that. Um, and then we, you know, partner with her. So we scheduled a holiday party in, in December and believe it or not, twice it was canceled due to weather. <laughs> and so, um, we it got moved to January, so we weren't exactly sure what would happen, and it turned out amazing. It was standing room only. These pictures don't do it justice. We had to have at least a hundred people. It could have been more. Um, the key. So once again, we came with food, pizza, and we had drinks, and and um, we had goodie bags that for the the kiddos. Um, but in this case, Jill, um, what provided. Um, uh, she bought gifts and did a lottery drawing. And so people could decide what things they wanted to be a part of. You got five tickets for coming. It, it was every student, adult, child, everyone got five tickets. And so, and so she had some really great prizes. She advertised it well. And so therefore the room was packed. That was another absolutely fabulous, especially getting rescheduled twice. We were a little bit nervous on, um, how that would go. And it turned out amazing. So um, as you can see, she, the big, the big gift was a Nintendo Swish, Switch. She had Squishmallows and all sorts of something to appeal to everyone, kids and adults alike. So yeah, so that one was a ton of, and you can see again, once again, the Russian police department supported us in that uh, event too. And you can see Janine there. So there we are. Janine, are you on here today? We need to give her a shout out for all the things that she's doing too. <laughs> I don't know if she could make it today, okay. but oh, yeah, are you there, Janine? No, she had to step away, but um, yes, oh, she here. is. I'm here, yeah. Sorry. And, and yes, Sorry. And, and since Kara has joined the team too, she has also been. Um, I just didn't have any pictures with you in there, Kara. We got to get <laughs> selfies. I'm okay with that. <laughs> so anyway, so yes. So anyone have any questions? Questions or comments for, for Brenda? I also, you know, we have invited other schools to, to be a part of our community. And we focus primarily on our feeder schools. Um, but I do think it would be great if we did a district wide community event that across the board, all the schools were invited. It would, you know, we would need a few more hands on deck, but I also think that would be a fabulous um, event for us to do as well. One thing that I love about this is that you're, you're going out to the communities and, and friendship place and um, Oak, Terrace and, you know, going to these locations. And I think that that really is an impactful way to build relationships and trust and to um, increase the, you know, the personalization of the event and experience. Yeah. And that, that's been our goal is that we, we want to, we want to be present where in their neighborhoods and we, you know, and we are building a relationship. It has made a difference. We we see a difference. So, and and you're looking at it in a comprehensive way. Family, you know, you're you're working at Mayo High School, but this family engagement is a community, broad, you know, multi age, multi generational, um, multi dimensional kind of experience. Uh, so that's a, a wonderful way to be thinking about uh, engaging families and community. Thank you. Thanks again for having me today. So happy to have you. Lots of great comments in the chat. Um, thank you for those comments. And if anyone has more questions or comments for Brenda, um, you can definitely uh, reach out to her or to me and I can get the info to, uh, to her. But a wonderful example of, of outreach into the community.
Brenda, thank you. Do you have the dogs waiting for you? Not yet, but they will be here soon. So I again, thank you. I'm sorry I have to bail. I uh, but no, we I, we understand. We just want to see a picture of you with the dogs next month. So <laughs> yes, I will. Okay. I don't know if I'll be in them. It's but there will be students in them. So <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Brenda. Take care. Great to great to hear from uh, from Brenda about some of those uh, community events uh, going on. Um, and again, if you have uh, questions, thoughts. Um, uh, that you'd like to follow up on with her or through me, uh, we can uh, we can also do that. So we're going to transition from that to talking about something that's a little bit um, a little bit more broad. Uh, and and this next topic, we're just going to take about ten minutes to talk a little bit about the Rochester Public Schools Family Engagement uh, DISC work uh, re regarding the Family Engagement Framework. So I want to just give you a little bit of an overview about what's going on with this Family Engagement Framework in, uh, in RPS. Um, so when we're talking about uh, DISC groups, some of you have heard of DISC groups, that stands for District-Wide Initiatives for Strategic Change. Now, these DISC groups that are meeting this year, there are 11 uh, that are in motion this year, and then more uh, will be starting in the fall. And these are in response to the school board initiatives that, um, that the district is tasked with. And one of those initiatives is in family engagement. So over the last few months, there's a team of RPS leaders, uh, many of them involved, uh, some of them here today uh, as well. And this group of, uh, of leaders has been meeting, researching, discussing options for a family engagement framework. Now, when we're talking about framework, it's this idea of having, you know, having common language, having a vision, having kind of a, you know, a, a framework in place that we can share across the district that gives us a, a common vision from site to site. So we'd been doing this work and we recently selected and recommended a framework uh, called the dual capacity building framework. Uh, that along with the Minnesota family engagement model is what we recommended um, in a summary report to the superintendent, Dr. Kent Pakal. We had some discussions uh, with the superintendent and he was enthusiastic about, uh, about our ideas and he approved of that to go forward to the school board in a few months. And so now the team is meeting to develop an implementation plan proposal for that framework. So I'm giving you a little bit of this overview because we're all going to come into play um, in the in the coming uh, months uh, because I'll need your input and involvement in the process as well. So let's just actually go forward a couple here. I'll come back to these um, later. But let's talk a little bit about the framework. Now, I know this is probably kind of hard to see on your screen, uh, but we're going to dig into this in a future month. So we don't have to worry too much about the specifics uh, for now, um, but this dual capacity building framework comes from Dr. Karen Maps from Harvard, and her team developed this framework, and it has gone through some revisions. And the framework is called dual capacity because it focuses on educators on one portion and families on the other portion. And of course, as the model, um, as the model exemplifies, both are supposed to be meeting and moving toward each other and meeting together uh, over time. So it starts over here on the left with what we have is the challenge. Now we know that there's a challenge that exists in family engagement. Um, the challenge for educators might be that educators maybe have received minimal training in family engagement. Maybe they've developed deficit mindsets in some cases. Of course, this is not across the board in, in certain situations. Maybe haven't been exposed to strong examples of family engagement and maybe don't think of partnership as an essential practice. Now, we know in Rochester Public Schools, we have a lot of strengths in family engagement work. We just saw that with Brenda Shamblin. We see it every day uh, at sites all over the place. 
And we also know that there could be some gaps. Uh, there could be some more work to do. So we acknowledge both of those things can be true at the same time. Families um, might have had negative experiences with schools, with educators, might not feel um, like they have reason to be trusting. Maybe they don't feel invited to contribute to their children's education, or maybe they feel disrespected or unheard or unvalued. So we, we know that a challenge exists on both sides. So what this framework does is it allows us to think about the essential conditions that we need to create in order to work toward our ultimate goal, which is effective partnerships that support students and school improvement. That's where we're trying to get together. And to do that, we need to work on processes and organizational conditions in order to build the capacity. And that's why, of course, we're calling it capacity building, build the capacity of both educators and families. So we're working on uh, building capacity of both to empower our educators and to empower our families and ultimately achieve this effective partnership that is going to support our students. So this is the, the dual capacity building framework that we have uh, recommended that our school district adopt as kind of a, a, a behind the scenes framework that informs the practices uh, that we engage in. Now, in addition to that, the state of Minnesota has taken this framework uh, from Karen Mapp and has done some of their own work that they have just recently unveiled at the end of summer. So MDE uh, has been operating on the premises of Karen Mapp, these four premises that come from her book, uh, Powerful Partnerships. And that is that all families have dreams for their children and want the best for them. That all families have the capacity to support their children's learning. That families and school staff are equal partners. And that the responsibility for cultivating and sustaining partnerships among school, home, and community rests primarily with school staff, especially with school leaders, that the responsibility really rests on the school district, school leaders, schools to take the initiative to build the relationships with our families. So with that in mind, MDE has, uh, has given more resources and attention to family, school, and community engagement and have developed some tools and one of those is their model for family engagement, which includes these seven essential elements. And these are based on Karen L. Mapp's work, as well as other practitioners in the field of family engagement. So Minnesota has developed these seven, uh, seven components. They're not meant to be a hierarchy. That's why the model is kind of circular, because it's not meant to be sequential or hierarchical. It's meant to be a continuum. Uh, but these include sustaining high trust and reciprocal relationships, amplifying parent voice, linking families to learning, not just to fun. Fun is good, but also to learning and to the ability to um, uh, work with their students uh, on their learning. To expect all departments and staff to partner with families, meaning all departments and all staff commitment to continuous improvement of the family engagement process, use of inclusive and transparent communication, and seeing the school as a community space uh, beyond the school day. So those are some of the things that we're also going to be working with in Rochester Public Schools over the coming months and years. And the state of Minnesota has also developed some tools that accompany this, uh, stages of development tools, where we can look at some exemplars and descriptors of each of these different uh, components. So that's the broad overview, kind of the big picture of some of the, some of the work that's going on um, regarding frameworks and models to give us uh, some language. So I'd like to just take a couple of minutes and knowing that this is broad overview, next month we'll dig in a little bit more. Um, but I'm wondering, what do you notice about the framework and model? And what questions or comments do you have about what you saw in grief in those few minutes? Feel free to um, turn on your microphone and let us know if there's something that 
stands out to you or that you have a question about or notice or wonder about, or you can put something in the chat as well if you prefer. Sarah Louise is with us. Hi, Sarah Louise. Hello. Oh, let me get my camera. Sorry. We I'm would taking, love to see you. I'm taking this meeting in the parking lot. So. Oh, that's, well, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> it's raining. So um, I like that while it acknowledges the historical piece, so like harm that has been done, is also very strength-based in looking at how do we partner to move forward and highlighting that collaboration and how impactful that will be um, once it's in motion. So I like the strength-based piece of the framework. I love the way that you framed that um, because that is such a, I'm just gonna go backward to this, um, in that dual capacity building framework, as you brought up, we know that there have been historical challenges and that they exist. And as you said, we want to focus on those strengths and how can we get some forward momentum to do better. Beautiful. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments or questions, things that you notice or wonder? I have a link to the website. I'll give you a link to that website. And notice on this slide, you will have access to a link as well to Karen Mapp's website as well. So if you want to explore more, um, there is a link that will be on the slides that I'll share out later. And she has some great videos there as well. If you'd like to immerse yourself a little bit more in some of uh, that information. And just as a note, this is kind of the, you know, the, the language we might use as a framework. And of course, we deliver this in a different way to our families, right? So that's one of the things that we'll be talking about going forward. Um, so be thinking over this next month about you know, what do you notice about the framework? What questions, comments, thoughts do you have? And we'll come back to uh, digging into it a little bit more next month. Um, but I do also want to tell you uh, about some community and parent perspectives uh, focus groups that are going to be coming up. And these focus groups, I'm working with um, Dr. Peter Ruck. Our team has talked a little bit with him about uh, protocol for focus groups. And we're going to be having a couple of focus groups and more if there's more interest. Uh, next week that will involve parent and community members giving some feedback uh, on seven questions. So I have questions aligned with those seven components, essential components of the family engagement framework. And in these focus groups, I'd love to have parents who are interested in talking about family engagement and their experiences and their vision for the future, their vision for change. So if you know of any parents who might be interested in that, if you are a parent who might be interested in that, um, you can email or call me. Uh, I will be including this information also in the slides that I send out later today so you can look back at this. Um, and if these dates don't work out for you or the people you're thinking of, let me know of some uh, alternatives or just let me know that you'd like to participate and I'll set up some additional times coming up because I'd love to get some input from our parents and community members on the topics uh, that we're thinking about. So focus groups uh, coming up. All right, so before we move on from there, any, um, any more thoughts about family engagement and that big picture of the framework. All right, so what happens is, uh, just as a quick uh, synopsis of, of that leading into what next, our team will continue to meet and make an implementation plan that we'll submit to the superintendent and to the school board 
And then next school year, there would be some uh, beginnings of implementation in some capacity of, um, of some new family engagement mindsets and professional development and, um, and parent empowerment as well. So we'll be looking at those pieces uh, coming up in the months ahead. All right, well, thank you for um, listening to that. And next time we'll engage a little bit more in some of those specifics. We're gonna go from that like big picture topic into something really fun and tangible and concrete that makes me think about spring. So, so here is, um, here's our great colleague, um, Dustin Morrow, who many of you already know. If you don't know Dustin yet, you will soon know his infectious enthusiasm and energy. Um, he is our Safe Routes to School coordinator and also coordinates the bike fleet that has been growing exponentially and has lots of potential um, this spring to bring smiles to many kids' faces. So, um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Dustin and have you tell us a little bit about um, the bikes and safe routes to school. Hi, Dustin. How is it going? It's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's Sounds like awesome. walk to school day was a success last week. Yeah, a lot of good partners there. Everything went off good. So happy to see it <clears throat> be a success. It sounds like, a, yeah, it sounds like good participation and uh, safe routes to schools. Any updates there? Uh, the biggest one is what we're talking about right here. So a lot of the effort that we're putting forth is, is going to be with this bike fleet and getting it integrated into the school and uh getting it used awesome well we're excited to hear about this so what can you tell us about the the rps elementary bike fleet yeah if you want to do, do I? Going? oh there we go okay good yeah i was gonna say <laughs> you probably don't have control yeah Sorry. <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the the five w's kind of what it is how we can how it's been used um and and how it can be used in the future here so rps was awarded a boost grant from mindot safe routes to school program it was right around thirty five thousand um, dollars almost for the i see some hands moving there but it was for the purchase of uh bikes helmets a trailer wrap and decals for the trailer bike roadie equipment and maintenance tools to upkeep um, to provide training and opportunities for students in elementary mainly fourth and fifth graders we determined that's like the kind of the perfect age of being able to to teach and have a good control of the class um walk bike fun curriculum is utilized and it's offered for free through minnesota it's a it's a standardized um curriculum that's approved through the state so that's what we use that's interesting i didn't realize that there was a there was a standard curriculum so there you go so they actually can learn about the safety components of yeah of the yeah the walk bike fun curriculum it's all the way from kindergarten all the way through so they teach basic safety stuff for walking as well as bike riding as well so who <clears throat> i'm going to take a big part of this so I, I want heavy involvement in using the bikes getting teachers trained getting staff up to date on the the bike fleet also Olmsted county public health joanne judge deets she actually wrote the grant and helped with all the whole process. She helps with pretty much <clears throat> most things, bikes and a lot of other things in the district. And Joanne is here too. I, I think Joanne is still here. So yeah. um, so good. We've got a partner here. So maybe she'd like to pop on and say something to you uh, at some point as well. Gotta I let hope you she know. does. Yeah. She speaks <laughs> much more eloquently than myself. Oh. <laughs> so. <laughs> Hi, Joanne. <laughs> we pulled you in here. So you you were you were a, a partner on this project. 
Yeah, we've had a couple of different bike fleets that are um, at different schools and the and that those are great for the kids at those schools, but we haven't had one that's that is movable and in its own trailer and we haven't had it at, um, across the board at elementary schools either. So our first ones were at middle schools and, and we learned really quickly that there are a lot of kids in middle schools that have never been on a bike. So it is going to be great to have um, have something at elementary and Dustin has just been doing an amazing job of working on um, walking and biking with all grade levels. So I can't wait to see what this is going to look like when it rolls out. Well, this is great. Nice collaboration. So the, uh, so the what? Tell us about that, Dustin. So we have all the bikes are purchased, the trailers purchased, um, we're getting the uh, decals and kind of the inside storage parts figured out. Um, I already purchased a few of the the ways to storm. We're just going to uh, buy the rest. But we have 35 bikes, various sizes, four to six adaptive bikes, um, a couple striders, probably get a few more of those. We have 45 helmets that are all sizes. So from, you know, small to extra large to accommodate any style of hair, any head size. Um, the curriculum is the walk, bike, fun that, that we talked about, bike rodeos, trail rides, field trips, after school programs. We did some last year and I know I already have some coming up on the docket at Sunset, Elton and Longfellow. I've been talking with a few schools so far. So um, where your location, so it is a mobile trailer so it can be brought to any any location um, in, in potentially a field trip. Um, the why, bike education and fun combined. So provide an equitable experience. <clears throat> Some things that we noticed last year is there was students that weren't able to even pedal or balance on a bike. So to be able to bring in a team, a group of people that are dedicated to helping students actually learn the basics i mean so there's students that can already ride trails perfectly and they can and that's awesome but we want to be able to you know to to hit everybody and make sure that everybody knows how to ride a bike and oh i see a hand yeah natalie go ahead yeah it's me dustin um i have to say we did this for our summer of discovery last year um, and it wasn't the fleet from Rochester, but it was phenomenal. Like yep. we set up a bike course on our blacktop. We had different sessions with olders and youngers to try and split them up. Like the more experienced got to learn how to Anyone ride. Anyone available to help look oh, for AQ? Sorry. <laughs> um, it was okay. like the kids got to go on a ride and learn how like street safety with um, the police department. And then other kids who had no idea how to ride a bike, like, we were able to support them here and then the police department ended up like bringing those kids bikes because they've never ridden. It was phenomenal and the work you guys did made it so easy for us and the, the kids still talk about it and ask, if I go to Summer mm -hmm. of Discovery again, do we get to ride bikes? And so mm -hmm. I just have to say, and you guys are doing another event with us too, so phenomenal yep. and I just, it was so exciting, so thank you. Awesome. And yeah, those are the events that, that we love. I mean, and you guys had plenty of staff out there to help. Everything was, was ready to go. So, I mean, it was a good, yeah, it was awesome. That's what we love to do. So Think I was going to share too. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. We go did ahead. scooters. So if you ever need to, we have scooters at our school. So if you ever need to borrow them for other events, kids just didn't feel comfortable. Dustin, you can let us know. Good, good to know. So scooters, so lots of things with wheels, right? <laughs> it just seems like a great combination to have the, the education piece, the fun piece, uh, all put together in this safe kind of environment with lots of adults present. Um, and that just really liberates those kids to, you know, to have some new growth. I love it. Well, good to hear. And Dustin, you were saying that um, that the fleet can be available at different times, like during the day for events. 
Yeah, correct. <laughs> yep. So, I mean, it is available for after school events as well yeah. as during the day for FIAD teachers. And um, so, yeah, we did like books, bikes, and braids. I know that's coming up. <clears throat> and we've done that in the past as well. So, and so some of the question about uh, capacity if, if schools are interested in this or different sites are interested, they probably want to contact you soon for spring before all of your spring nights are <laughs> spoken for. Yeah, definitely. And I'm always, you know, we're always willing to help and get something figured out. So, contacting me would be the best way. <clears throat> so, to, uh, talk about the first set of bikes. So for the past bikes, <clears throat> we kind of took those into account and we moving forward, we went with two different style of bikes. One is these 18 inch uh, super adjustable single speed uh, nine bot bikes that they can, I can fit on it. I'm like six one all the way down to a kindergartner could probably easily ride it. So they're super adjustable. The hand, the the handlebars go up and down the the seat goes up and down pretty far so that's why we went with uh this style of bike there's a training wheel option the chains enclosed so it's a super good bike to learn on uh the second set of bikes is for more of a advanced rider so they this has a shift you can seven speed shifter everything's quick release on it so they're super easy to adjust, um, disc brakes, low maintenance, um, which is kind of <clears throat> key for a fleet like this to not have a, a ton of things that need maintenance on them. And our adaptive bikes, which the Rochester School Board Foundation, that's who we got this grant through. We were able to get six, six bikes <clears throat> to add to the fleet so these are kind of the styles of them they're uh three wheeled so they can be used by numerous people and then there's a strider strider style as well for learning how to balance <clears throat> and how many did you say of the adaptive bikes are available there are six total so, so they, they uh, come yeah, they come in different sizes. There's two small, two medium, and two large. So, and they in the the front wheel actually has a quick release that can go in and out. So, it could probably fit somebody who's I know Longar, who's like seven foot tall, could probably ride the one. He's I've seen him quite a bit out at Friedel, and he could probably ride the largest one all the way down to probably. The smaller one easily a kindergartner could could go on so we could hit every every age group and with these striders um those are are those typically used then to learn the balancing before on the early end of of learning to ride yeah pre yeah pre-paddling and so there are two striders in your fleet yep two so far and we'll we'll get uh, probably a few more as well to add. That's phenomenal. Oh, and I love this and these photos of the of the kids. Tell us about this. Yeah, so maintenance was like the key component to to this fleet that we wanted to make sure we did. So, <clears throat> Bridge Collaborative, Amy, <clears throat> uh, we got a grant approved for. A, three full sets of uh, maintenance tools, as you can see kind of in the middle there. Um, we've partnered with New Spin Bike Shop and we have a full maintenance uh, room set up at Friedel at Middle School Right Fit. Um, and they've helped <coughs> as well as Rail has came over and helped. Rail helped put together, Rail and uh, Right Fit helped put together all of the the bikes that that we got that were the uh the trike the trike bikes so they unboxed them put them together using all the maintenance tools that we had so i mean and then they work on all the bikes that we get donated in so it's kind of a a win-win partnership there 
the students are learning all these skills about bike um, bike repair and maintenance, using the tools, um, and look at these kids and their smiles and just loving it, this hands-on experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, and Director Barlow is with us and has a question. Yeah, Destin, I just wanted to say kudos. Um, student engagement, you know, right fit rail. Sometimes we're trying to figure out, well, where are these guys and what can they do? And and thank you. I don't know, you know, where that insight came from, but but what a great idea. And it's something uh, that we need to celebrate, not only through your presentation now, but beyond. So, so thank you. And I'll probably swing over there, not bring my bike to have it repaired, but just <laughs> here to, to check it out. Yeah, bring bring your bike over too. Oh, okay. Yeah, I love that. Well, we'll have to let you know about the upcoming events, so you can join in uh, on the on those with your your bike. But this is phenomenal, and and the students learn so much from this experience and doing that that hands on work and engaging with you in the process. Yeah, all of those pieces. Thank you. Great idea. Um, to include that. And look at this. So this is Bike Fleet in action. Yeah, so this was our Bike to School Day last year. And uh, yeah, RPD was there and did it, had a big piece of that. So we got a, some good pictures there helping adjust helmets. There's me up there. I think we donated around 20 some odd bikes at john adams and gage so we did a, a bike ride from ja to gage which is the feeder school to john adams and then we did a a little collaborative bike ride with the gage students and the john adams students which was fun love that good good partnering there too and i just like the many levels you know it's different age levels working together a variety of different schools and community partners and all of that just makes it uh, feel really impactful in a lot of ways. And <clears throat> the street and trail rides. So we are able to do street rides as well. They're semi scary to me still, just because I'm used to riding on the sidewalk, but the sidewalk isn't actually the safest place to ride. We can talk to Joanne about that. She knows all the good details. <laughs> so we actually enlisted the help of RPD to help with that as well. And they actually had a squad car drive, I think just behind us, just to kind of block traffic off a little bit as we rode up um, 18th Avenue on the way to gauge which should help help everybody feel a little bit more safe so we do have options like that if there's like some hesitancy about riding on the street that we can use you know some of our partners like that trail rides which are awesome um i know at Longfellow, certain schools have better access to to trails but street rides are always an option bike rodeo events is typically what we do and we're in the, the making of setting up a bike obstacle course as well we have some awesome thoughts on different things we can do there so we hopefully can roll that out here with the fleet as well i'm fully ready to get my bike out and tuned up now that you're talking about all of this <laughs> <laughs> i have some serious spring fever <laughs> yeah <clears throat> so we're going to have a, a SOP, it's already in the process, we're kind of wrapping it up. I'm getting a couple more pictures of stuff to include in there, and we're, we're using uh, some of the right fit students for that too, so they'll be included in the, the SOP. And it's going to include everything from, you know, the different trainings that we, we do, the partners that we have, the bikes, the trailer, how to use it. Um, maintenance tools um let's see yeah the and we're going to change so we will have a, a walk bike fun training coming up in the near future i'm still working through some of the details with that so it's not going to be on march 3rd but um, i'm working with some of the elementary um fire teachers and that's 
once we get a good date locked down, I can put that out. And if anybody's interested and wants to get trained in that, it's typically going to be an eight hour training. <clears throat> and if it's a teacher that needs uh, the CEC credits, I think you get like eight or so credits for that. The district gets reimbursed for subs um, through Bike MN as well. So there'll be more information on that coming out. But if you have interest in that, you can shoot me an email as well. That's good to know. So it might be applicable to like site facilitators or uh, or maybe, as you said, PE teachers or specifically teachers who might be um, really involved as instructional coaches or family liaisons at their school. Yep. And we're good. I think we'll also bring in like some of the CAT team members that are new, the RPD that typically help with a lot. Um, we can bring in if there's going to be some uh, community members that want to be super active and volunteering and helping out, um, they can join as well. So it's not just <clears throat> school district. The checkout process, that's still kind of a, a work in process. So, okay. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> yeah, she's I, in I speak in, yeah, I speak in uh, <laughs> terms that not everybody might not know. So, yeah, we're working <laughs> through. Acronyms. Yeah, the acronyms, yep. Um, with the, uh, the district curriculum team to kind of hopefully iron out a perfected checkout process but as of right now it'll just be you know reach out to me shoot me an email it's sort of in the works trying to figure out the best best way yep. yeah so what should we keep in mind yeah a, f a few things here when setting up events staffing is key so just making sure that you get good parent involvement, good teacher involvement. Um, if you want to set up an after school event, I can typically get some volunteers, but depending on how many students you have attending, you know, we may need more bikes, which obviously will need more human capital, as we can call it, as I wrote in. So we do have limited resources. And if there's back to back to back events, um, you know, it might limit how many that I can come up with. So just make sure that when you're going through the process or we're helping you through the process of getting something figured out that we keep that in mind. And at some of the events, it sounds like it has worked well if there are different stations of things where maybe there's, you know, like the book spikes braids, for example, right? We have some, some people are maybe doing something with literacy and some people doing the bikes and, you know, different stations and rotation uh, for an event can work pretty well. Mm -hmm. Good. And Joanne. So I just wanted to add that there's just been a real effort with this seat to ensure that we are looking at equity and so there are a lot of things that can be done with the fleet that can be for a fun after school event um, but really best practice would be that that fleet is used for every kid in every elementary school so that would be it'd be awesome if we got every single um, teacher um, trained and every um, you know, and parents involved in every single school, because that's really, um, that's really what we want to see. One of the things that um, does add to the amount of volunteers that are needed are the kids that, that have no expertise, they've never been on a bike before. And those are the kids that we really want to reach. So, um, one school, for example, said we, we want to do this in PE. We have a PE teacher, or Dustin and myself. Um, but that isn't enough to really have 30 kids on bikes. And so um, the option was, like, if we don't have enough volunteers, the kids that don't know how to ride might not be able to go on a trail ride. They might have to stay back in school. And that's absolutely the opposite of what we want with the, with the fleet. We want those kids who've never been on a bike to get from balancing to actually being able to ride in the couple of weeks that the that um, PE is is using bike education at school. And so 
just consider that as, um, you know, and getting volunteers and, and families excited about this fleet. That's really our goal is to get everybody to be able to ride a bike. Thank you for bringing up that equity piece, Joanne, and thinking about um, maybe having it be just more of a taste, right, and developing the, the skills and the capacity to be able to continue uh, the practice of biking as well and uh, get that um, exposure to everybody. All right. And Julie, uh, one more. Yep. I want to give Joanne and Dustin a shout out. They, I've had a chance to work with them over the last little over a year since I've been in this role and they are phenomenal and they go above and beyond. If you bring an idea to them and say, how do we make this work? They will figure out a way um, and they're quick and they're mm -hmm. great at finding resources to help you do what you want to do. So I highly re recommend reaching out to them and working with them. Julie, thank you so much for saying that. Um, for those of us who know Dustin and Joanne, we know that is true, right? That uh, they'll move mountains to make this work. And so if um, if you have questions, if you have an interest in bringing this to your site, um, then go ahead and reach out to, uh, to Dustin, to um, Joanne for that uh, support as well, um, or to me, and I can get you in touch with them as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really grateful for you uh, bringing that to our attention and love the all of the things that that can bring to kids and families. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Dustin. Yeah. All right. So watch for those bikes. Hopefully uh, they'll be at your school soon. Uh, very exciting to think about. Well, Amy Baker, you've been you've been waiting there patiently. For those of you who um, who have not heard about these outreach uh, opportunities for children and families, there are some amazing things going on. And Amy and I met uh, a few weeks ago and talked about some of these, and I didn't know that all of these things were going on. So I'm so excited to have her highlight uh, some of the programming going on in ECFE. So, Amy, what would you like to tell us about? Well, can you open the link that I sent you? There you go. Perfect. So we often think of Rochester Public Schools as K-12, but we have um, programming from birth to 12th grade in our district, which is pretty amazing. Um, the early childhood family services portion of things um, kind of lives out of four buildings in our district, which is Hawthorne, um, Northrop, Mighty Oaks, and Hoover Early Learning Center, the new side of, of Hoover. Go ahead, Jen, you can switch it on. Um, we In those different things, under our umbrella lives the Family Literacy Program, which is for families who are learning English as a second language or doing some of the pathway um, programs that live at Hawthorne, maybe finishing their GED or getting their adult diploma. And we provide quality early childhood experience um, as well as parent education connected with that program out of Hawthorne. Right now we're serving 31 families in that program currently. Go ahead, Jen. Well, and some of you remember from last month, Yvonne uh, spoke about participating in that program. And so oh. that's our connection uh, from last month as well. Perfect. Um, another part of the under the umbrella is early childhood screening. This is a state requirement. Um, and our goal is to get kiddos in right when they turn three um, in hopes of figuring out if there's anything they could need extra for services, vision, hearing, maybe um, we might find some um, developmental delays or cognitive delays and we can get them hooked up with services so they're ready to get started in school. So far as of um, the end of 22, we had gotten seven, 780 kiddos screened at that point in the school year. So go on. Um, the district also has preschool. So um, we know we have lots of early childhood special ed programs. We hear about that more early childhood special ed programs. But many of those classrooms are co-taught with gen ed teachers as well. And so this is more from the gen ed side. We have 232 preschoolers currently enrolled in the gen ed program. And those are housed out of the Northrop, Hoover and Mighty Oaks. Um, buildings. And so that is a really cool thing that is expanding every year um, at our district's buildings. Exciting. 
Um, maybe if you've had little kids, you've seen this brochure come out. Um, we have lots of ECFE classes. ECFE stands for Early Childhood Family Education. This is a state-funded program um, that is unique to Minnesota, which is very, very cool. So it's programming that's um, two generations at a time. So we have parent education and early childhood education simultaneously in these programs. Um, all of our staff, our licensed staff, um, either with a parent ed license, an early childhood license, or an ECFE license, which allows you to, to teach both early childhood and parent ed. Go ahead. Oops, sorry, oh. I accidentally played the video, but oh, that yep. could be for, I'll include that link in the slide, so you sure. will all yep. be able to access it. Um, in those brochures, things that, I try to pull out things that maybe pertain to the elementary ages or, or supporting going into elementary. So in the spring here, we have all about, or the big yellow school bus. We have district and um, district transportation people that will come and answer questions of parents. We have a bus there that kids learn how to safely ride a bus and then they get to take a practice bus ride. So to kind of get some questions answered, um, that's something you could promote to your incoming kindergartners. Um, uh, every year we have this big transportation fair. Um, we're going back to Northrop this year and the and there'll be every kind of vehicle you can think of with wheels. It's open to the community. It's free. Um, and that's May 13th. And it's been going on for years. So something you can share with families. So much fun. Yeah, love my that. kids love that. Um, a, a service we provide up through third grade um, is a parent ed consultation. So this is a one-on-one -on -one kind of parent coaching. This is something I do as part of the outreach parent ed position. Um, so parents might have some specific things they're struggling with. And um, really my role is to kind of walk them, talk, talk through it with them. They often have the solution within them. They just have to kind of talk it out and find ideas, but I will also support them in that if needed. Um, so that is something that you can share with families who might be saying, you know, I just can't get my kid to do X, Y, Z, or I'm really struggling with this behavior or whatnot. And um, that would be a service you could share with your families that's available to them free of charge through our district. I love that note that uh, that reminder that it's through third grade, third, uh, which is really yep. helpful to know yep. that it's not limited to pre uh, preschool. Yep. So some of our classes go higher. Um, early childhood has been defined by the state through up through third grade. So um, the ones that we can do that we try to expand it so that we can support all. This is a class that I teach called Parenting Children with Spirited and Challenging Behaviors. Um, many kiddos get referred to this class um, from their pediatrician, from their social work, um, from early childhood screening, like if they have an elevated social emotional screening when they go through screening. Um, that screening is kind of intended to kind of find maybe some of our spectrum things, our anxiety, our ADHD. And um, often it's our parents are on their kind of first getting used to the idea that maybe there's something here that we need to get extra supports for. And or it could be maybe um, parents need a few more tools in their toolbox. And so that's what this class is intended for. It's for kids through their kindergarten year. So if there's kiddos in kindergarten that um, you think the families could really benefit for this, um, that is available to them. We do provide sibling care for kiddos. 10 months to nine years. So if they have older siblings or younger siblings, we provide care for those classes as well. Good to know. So there's support there for that. Yep. Um, we have a stay and play. This is a kind of get your, just try it out. Um, you can sign up per Friday that it works for you. It's birth to five-year-old. It's a good, if you think there's somebody that could benefit from this, they could try it out and see if they like it before they commit to a session that's longer than one week. So nice idea. Yep. Uh, we have a parenting children with special needs um, group, support, support group. It meets second Tuesday of every month all year long. And that goes through fifth grade. Um, and so child care is provided. And, and then we bring in lots of speakers and lots of support for families who are parenting kiddos with special needs up through fifth grade. And it keeps going, Amy. There's so much. I know. I know. I know. Um, especially I we, have, we have a single parents group and go keep going. I'm sorry. I don't want to take too long, but no, I don't want to. I'm sorry that I don't want you to feel rushed. Um, oh, this so is this is the good. partnerships that um, you were kind of referring to. So uh, the community outreach position that I have was divine. 
or created to kind of reach out to families who weren't coming to us at our building. It's much of the families we're talking about equity wise, like how do we make sure we're serving all of our families? And so my position is to really connect with programs that already have built trust with some of these um, families that maybe don't trust systems um, naturally all the time and then figure out what they're doing and how I can support it. And so we do that at Jeremiah program three times a month. I join their sisterhood hour. Go ahead. Um, um, I do, we do parent the life skills classes for family promise. It's the family shelter in town. Um, and this program started out where I would go just to the day center and there might be two parents and like five kids. And now it has expanded. This is just the elementary age room um, on one of the nights, but often we'll have 30 to 50 people. They come have a meal together and then the kids go to programming based on age and the parents come to parent ed or they bring in speakers um, as well to kind of build life skills for these families. Pretty cool community that's been built. That go ahead. To the next I love that photo. Um, a, a cool example of um, things that we've added into that is we have a mental health component now this year. And like last month, we had a parent who when we were, you know, just checking in, she shared some scary things she was kind of struggling with. And I said to her, like, I don't know that, you know, talking about how do we talk to our kids about sex right now is what you need, like based on what she shared. And so I was able to say, like, do you want to go talk with the therapist who's like sitting in the room with us? And those two were able to leave and she could get one on one support for the thing that she needed right then, which was pretty cool. And that's something that's evolved kind of over the years. Um, Public health support. This. Oh, that. Sorry. That was with Family Promise. OK, um, this is Olmstead County. Uh, they do home visits for kiddos and we do a play group with them uh, twice a month. Um, so just ideas of ways. We also have partnered with schools. We'll do um, offer a parenting session, a topic online or in person. Um, so just trying to give you ideas of ways we might be able to support you. This is a once a month drop. And if you have kiddos, sometimes parents who have newborns are scared. Are they gaining weight? We have we have a scale there, a public health nurse is there, parent educators there to answer kind of all their questions that they're scared of because they put that kid in the car seat and put them in your car and you're like, they're going to just let us take this kid home. Like there's no manual. What are we doing? This? <laughs> um, this is another group that we partner with Olmstead County Reach Program. Many of you might be familiar with the PACE program. Um, this is like the, the younger version of that program. So birth to five. Um, and this is a once a month group that meets, um, they all speak English as their second language. Um, their caseworker speaks Arabic and can translate for most of them, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, so that's one of the supports that we offer as well. Um, and I think there's only one more, right, Jennifer? Oh, and then Khadija, you are on there. Look at that. I pulled right from her her page. Pomojo Women, we've just started this year providing a once a month um, parenting support as well. And that's going to grow as, as we see fit, but maybe there's things you're offering. Maybe there's things you've thought, like, I'd like to add a parent component to maybe one of our, um, you know, family engagement nights. And, um, we are always open to talking about what that could look like. So we'd love to be a resource for you. Oh, I love that, Amy. And that's a, it's a good reminder because of course we have our, you know, our elementaries, maybe K-5 or whatever, but of course we have these family events where people are coming into those events on site with, you know, kids of all ages and little ones who are going to be entering school. And we don't want to forget about the importance of the impact of our early childhood family education. And, mm -hmm. and to know all of these things that are going on is outreach in the community. And as you said, to maybe, you know, are there, is there potential for co-design for other opportunities? You know, that's a great, a great thing to have in mind. Um, your open, openness to that is, um, is really exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Questions or comments for Amy? You covered a lot of ground. It's a lot <laughs> that you have going on. Well, and it's one of the departments that like we just don't even know that we have available in our program or in our district sometimes. So good to make that known. So thank you for letting us share. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. And I'll share uh, the slides out um, uh, as well in the, the video um, or with the, the video link that you had and the, and the link to all of those. And if uh, other people who uh, follow up on the notes uh, need to, they can get in touch with you that way as well. 
Amy, thank you so much. Uh, grateful mm -hmm. for all of that information. And thanks to everybody who's been staying on for this hour and a half. I know it's a lot of information uh, in this time frame. Uh, there was a lot of good stuff to cover today. And what I'm going to do is if, if you need to leave, no problem. Otherwise, I'm just going to go through like about two minutes of super fast uh, announcements. And I'll be really quick. Um, for sure, if you need to leave, no problem. But these announcements are going to be so fast. One of those is that we are starting um, in collaboration with the bilingual interpreter specialists. I'm going to be having um, parent nights in multiple languages. We had one last night in Arabic, and next week there's going to be uh, one uh, in Spanish and English, and then in Somali and English uh, a couple of weeks from then. And we're going to be rotating through different languages every week or two. And so watch for these flyers. You'll see them on the RPS website and going out in RPS Facebook. Communications department is, is helping work on the flyers. And so those are going to be going out um, advertising these um, kind of co-design and listening session discussion opportunities for uh, parents to try to elevate our multilingual parent voices. So watch for those. Um, also, there's an opportunity. I'm not sure if Natalia is still with us. I know Natalia had other things um, today too, but Natalia, if you happen to be there, would you like to speak to this one? Yeah, um, and so the district is working on this community curriculum and instruction advisory committee. And so we would like to reach out to parents, community members who would like to be part of this um, to help us inform some of the decisions that are uh, related to curriculum. So there's a tiny URL at the bottom for the, for the form so that you can sign up and then we'll send information uh, for the the details and there's a QR code as well. So please um, print the flyer and spread it out to the people you have contact with. Thank you for bringing, uh, bringing that up. And then I, I think that the first meeting might be taking place in, it's March or April, and I don't remember which month. April 13th. Thank you. Thank yes, you. and the nurse provided. Oh, so, yeah. It says right there. Thank you. <laughs> so April 13th for that first meeting. So we have some time if you know of families uh, who might be interested in this kind of thing, spread the word. Thank you, Natalia, for telling us about that. Um, talking points, we continue to see lots of use of talking points and it's expanding uh, to more schools. Over 520,000 messages have been exchanged since September 1st. We're staying at about the 13% of those are translated into 45 languages other than English. Um, keep in mind that um, if families want to use the app, then there is the text to speech option on the free app. Um, some people prefer to have it show up in as a text message uh, instead, and that's just fine. Um, and we can change the language. If a family doesn't want their messages translated, it can be changed to English. So they can do it themselves in the app or somebody at their school, their teacher, uh, their student's teacher or office manager can change the language uh, if they want that change. So it is initially whatever language is entered in Skyward is what is translated in talking points, but many families um, might wanna change that in talking points and um, that is uh, an option. So talking points continues. Um, lots of things of course going on in RPS and the community updates uh, as well. So um, continue to check out the RPS uh, website to meet your school board members, info about kindergarten enrollment, school closings, the RPS strategic plan, um, new volunteer uh, registration opportunities, uh, and, uh, and more. Uh, the PTA, Family School Partnerships, is offering many webinars uh, coming up about family engagement. So this will be included on the slides that I send out later if you're interested in more, as well as the U.S. Department of Education um, uh, partnering uh, with webinar. There are going to be, I think, six webinars uh, on family engagement as well. So uh, that link is accessible. I'm not sure if Amelia is still with us. I think Amelia Cordell is with us briefly. 
but I know that a lot of people have had to step away since we are so long. But the powwow, um, save the date, honoring the graduates, powwow is going to be May 6th. 1 p.m. Uh, in the Mayo High School Gymnasium. So just getting that word out because I know many people in our district uh, like to attend and support. Um, Amelia Cordell is the contact uh, for that and just keep that in mind on your calendar. FAFSA information for our high school students is offered in multiple languages, Spanish, Hmong, and Somali. And if you know of anyone who would benefit from this information, uh, this is also has a link uh, in the slides as well. And the global markets uh, continue in February and March, uh, community uh, global markets. So if you have interest in participating in that, uh, there are some family-friendly activities uh, as part of that. That brings us to our end, our next meeting, a month out, Tuesday, March 14th. We will be online again, 10 o'clock to 11.30 or 11.30-ish. Thanks for staying a little bit long today. Um, and if you need to contact me, please uh, feel free to contact me about anything. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, if you have questions or comments, I'll stay on for a few minutes. And otherwise, I will look forward to whenever our paths cross next. So take care. Happy Valentine's Day. And thanks so much, everybody, for being here. Have a great day. See you soon. Thank you.